Hello? Do you hear me? Yeah? It works, I think? Yeah, I don't know. Hello? Can everyone hear us? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think we should, we should start. I think we should start uh, if you find your seat. Maybe you can put it slightly higher, the microphone. Higher? You can put your microphone. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I think if you are ready, we are going to start. Yeah? So in this session, we are going to give a tutorial on learning-based Java. It's a kind of learning-based programming language. Um, I'm Parisa, and uh, I will, uh, we will do this with uh, Christos. Our uh, names will be in the syllabus, by the way, to test, to pronounce them correctly. So <laughs> we'll be checking you. Okay. No, that's not true. <laughs> so. Um, the structure of the course will be like we introduce some interesting application. I hope that you find it more interesting. And then we uh, point you through the demos to uh, learning based Java language and the actual environment. Um, so we will see um, how it goes. So from the previous uh, courses, I, I guess that you have learned uh, about the general concept of machine learning. Uh, so we don't need to point to that. But I believe that you, you haven't still learned about the algorithms of how these te techniques, different techniques uh, and algorithms that uh, you can have for learning. Um, but we think you still can do a lot of uh, cool things using the existing tools uh, and looking at the machine learning algorithms as a black box. And we think that even you er, er, can earn money using it by just having <laughs> a couple of sessions of this course. Like uh, what people do in DeepMind, Yahoo, Somli, Twitter, Web, mm, Wetlab, and so on. And uh, we're going to um, discuss how you can do machine learning easily without knowing the actual um, mathematical and all formalization behind it. Uh, the application that we are going to discuss um, is let's analyze uh, tweets. You see that we have a lot of data, Twitter posts that people make every second. For example, here heard someone sing a Christmas song in the pub on Friday, give us a break. So this is uh, posted from Illinois. And then maybe we want to see if this is really a happy tweet or not. And we look at the other post. For example, my mom just dragged me to Walgreens and forced me to get a flu shot. And then she told me it was just like mother-daughter tattoos. So this is uh, probably not a happy tweet made from Illinois. <laughs> and the next one is, just want to leave this past in the past and move on. So this made in Edinburgh and seems to be an unhappy tweet. So let's um, think about it as a learning problem. We want to look at these tweets and um, say, if have a model to say if these are happy tweets or not unhappy tweets. And maybe we want to make some meta-analysis later on these uh, decisions, like which location is happier. We look at the location of the, for example, we look at the Illinois, all the tweets, we classify all of them as happy and unhappy, and then we can decide if this place is really a place that people give more happy tweets, or is it a happy place, or so on. So this is like maybe some basic analysis. You can do more serious analysis about different things, like politics, what, uh, what candidates in the election people are happy about, and uh, say more positive things about it. 
So this is actually uh, the application, but I'm going to review what kind of steps we want to do to make a machine learning model to do such tasks. So you know that from the course, I think that we are going to learn from experience, learn from examples. So the first step is to create examples. So the way to do it for this task is that, OK, let's um, call people and ask them to annotate the tweets for us as happy, unhappy. And then look at the examples, find out what are the influencing features for realizing the sense of a tweet, how, as a human, how we um, interpret something as happy or unhappy. So, and then see if we can really uh, model this kind of uh, interpretation that we have for as features for the machine learning models. And then the next step would be to choose the learning technique. So what kind of uh, method, um, what kind of hypothesis space we are going to look, what kind of technology we are going to use to choose our hypothesis among all possible hypotheses. And then use the model. When we have made the model, we are going to make predictions. Later on, we have a model for saying happy and happy. And later on, we are going to use our model to, to look at the Twitter and decide for every kind of tweet that we receive and mar label it as happy and unhappy and make our meta-analysis later based on that. And uh, you should uh, consider this step also that normally when we train machine learning models before we are going to use it in the actual uh, real world, uh, normally we test them and uh, we to see if uh, they work well or not. Uh, that's also one step that normally it's a kind of um, commonly used procedure. We train a model, and then we test it. And then when we see it works on some test data well, then we, we say, OK, this is OK, and we can rely on the um, decisions that this model makes in the future. So these were the steps. And then for this task, again, let's uh, review what we have here. Um, luckily, for this Twitter analysis, uh, there is already annotated data. So the University of Stanford, they made like um, a corpus with the different kind of tweets, and the people labeled it with positive or negative. Actually, this is also, I should mention that this is called sentiment analysis. In, this is a kind of well-known natural language processing task called sentiment analysis that you're going to find a sense of the um, sentences or the, mm, a piece of text. So there is a corpus for it. And then uh, the, we can use that corpus. And then after that, we, we will see uh, how we are going to uh, represent our sentences, the tweets, um, for appropriate to be appropriate for machine learning models. And for example, you can say the word occurrences in these tweets can be indicative of the sense. For example, if I see a word like cry, sad, horrible, it means this is a negative tweet. Or if I see, for example, nice, pleasant, and so on, maybe the sense is positive. It doesn't work always like this. It's not as easy as uh, like just looking at the lexical information. But this is an entry point, a starting point to um, the kind of simpler features that we can think of. And then um, the next step, so what kind of techniques? These are the list of techniques that uh, we will see that we have them actually in this uh, learning-based Java tool later. Uh, you will, it will be introduced to you. You see that we have a list of techniques that you can simply just call and see how it works on this data to train a model for sentiment um, analysis, like SVMs, knife-based, decision trees, sparse perceptron, and so on. And then the, thi the other thing that you should do for making predictions is that, OK, now I want to, the problem that I need to solve here also is that I cannot directly use the tweets and classify them. I still need to have the same representation of the training data for the coming tweets to be able to decide if those are positive and negative. And then for the testing, of course, there are some commonly used evaluation metrics that I think you will learn about this. But here also, we are going to introduce this tool and say, OK, these are some standard uh, metrics that you can just um, simply call them and use them to evaluate your model. So these are like four or five steps that you need to do for um, doing such a task. And then 
Now we are going to say how learning based Java will help you see, to do this just in half a day maybe or even less. So um, we have the Twitter post. We have learning based Java. Java is a language that helps you to uh, learn, uh, do learning and test in very few lines of code. And then you train the F. When you have the F, you train the model. Then later you have new posts. And then you use the same code to generate the feature representation of your unlabeled data and then make decisions based on them. For example, this t tweet, we haven't seen it in our data, but now it's a new tweet, and then we want to see if this is positive or not. So it hasn't been a week since school started, and I have already cried. So this uh, should be a negative <laughs> sentiment. So now uh, I'm going to just briefly overview what kind of components learning-based Java will uh, provide. It's a kind of modeling language. Uh, and it gives us the high-level primitives to program uh, for learning models. So um, what does it mean? We can, what, uh, what did it support, actually? So we can program using learning models. We can have high-level specification of features and constraint between classifiers and inference with constraints. So actually, the first class objects in LB Java are learners. Like when you have like a function, when you do like general purpose programming, you define a variable. It is x of type integer. Now you have your x of type learner. And you simply can say, now x learn and use this data. And it is as high level as the way that I describe it. So this is really great. You don't need to know how this learner is implemented, how it gets the feature, how to translate the features to the uh, appropriate representation. You can just connect it to the data. And is there a question? Yes. Sure. What do you mean by learner? Learner. So it's an object for me. Or it can be uh, looked at uh, like a function. A function that can train from the data. And then I use it as a black box. It's an F function is my learner. It observes some data. And then I give it this tweet. And I say, give me an output. And it says positive. So it's really a function, receives an input, and gives me an output. But this function can be learned. So that's why we call it a learner. Yeah. And then we have the learning, as, as I mentioned, as the main component of this language. And um, classifiers and functions defined in terms of the data. and Actually, you will see, we will go through the demo and the actual example. You will see that when you declare or you define, specify your model, the type of the feature at a high level, and then when you compile, actually, you have your uh, function already trained, and you can just use it. So this is the overview of the language. And the advantages is that it abstracts away the feature representation. Uh, the learning algorithms, the way that we do inference. So the inference is some complex, uh, more complex thing that we cover it in the next session. I don't describe what we mean by inference here. And then it allows you to write learning-based programs. Now I have these learners or functions that are trained and I can use them. And what does it mean to write a learning-based program? It means the type of analysis that I mentioned. I have a learner that says, a, Twitter is, a tweet is positive and negative. Then I can do additional analysis on this. If this tweet is positive, then this happens. I can just program and based on what the learning functions tell me uh, or give me the output, I can write for loops, decisions, and whatever. So I can write really a program uh, and use this learner as the building blocks or basic primitives. And then, uh, yeah, it's the same idea that you can reason about the application at hand. So, um, OK, you are going to take the course of machine learning. You are interested to learn the algorithms and all the mathematical stuff behind it. But uh, actually, these tools help you to, if you are not expert in what kind of uh, what these algorithms actually do, you can still look at them as black boxes develop your application, and then reason based on uh, what you get, and really work on your application, not really working on the uh, implementation of the algorithms and codes. So uh, now as an example, so that was the Twitter thing. Uh, 
you will get this as an exercise uh, actually to uh, we have ready code actually uh, Christos made uh, all this example with the data and everything ready for you uh, we will discuss it at the end of the course also that uh, that is something that you will uh, be practicing uh, but now we are going to go over uh, learning based Java. So we start with the same example that you heard in the course, the badge example, because we think that that is an example that you already thought about it. Uh, what is the features and how we uh, can model how this, uh, uh, how this function can work on this data. So that's why we are, I'm uh, giving an overview of the badge game and then we we'll switch to the uh, demo that uh, describes how we program for the badge uh, game in LB Java. So to review, just remind you, we had some names like um, Noaki, Abe, and Eric Baum, and these labels, uh, these names are labeled with positive and negative. Uh, we don't know why, and we are going to see uh, just examples labeled with these um, positive and negative labels. And from the examples, we want to figure out what happens, actually, how people made these positive negative labels. And we want to find, actually, uh, which functions uh, were used to assign these, wh which function was used to assign these labels. So um, I guess that you thought about uh, this problem. Maybe you started from simple rule, looking at, like, um, maybe, the first character of them is similar, the names, the second character is similar, or the third character is for all of them is A. So you look at the lexical form of these words, maybe, and then maybe you thought, okay, maybe it's not one rule, but two, two rules have, for example, the first character is this, and the second is that. Or maybe there is some lexical information, and also maybe it's some distinction between female name and male name, so the conceptual meaning, uh, the more conceptual features of this. So when, uh, for many real-world problems, it's not easy to really model if this then positive, um, else negative. So we cannot really write a number of if then else and decide uh, in these cases are positive and negative. We cannot easily find such a, there is a lot of uncertainty in the real-world problems. That's why we have, uh, we have to learn this from data. The, the function is too complex to just uh, write it as a number of rules. And that is why uh, we're going to learn this from examples. And now I just review the type of features that you might have thought about it, uh, like the gender, age, country of the person, length of their first name, the length of their last name, does the name contain a letter X, how many vowels does this name contain, is the nth letter is a vowel or not, and so on. But these are all kind of hypotheses that you can have, and it's very time consuming to try all of these and see if which of them works on this data and which doesn't work and find out the um, final hypothesis that works. So what we do, actually, we can easily uh, write all of these hypotheses as features. Like the first letter, the gender is a feature. The second letter, what happens in the second position is a feature. And then we try to give it to the machine and say now which feature works the best. The, the machine will, for example, if you have a linear model, it will learn the weight of each feature that works best for your uh, input data. So th in this way, you don't need to manually uh, write your hypothesis and check it and see if it works or not. You just, um, according to your knowledge about the domain, you are the expert, you see, okay, these are names, I have lexical information, probably this is based on the lexical information, but I cannot search all possibilities, I just write general features and give it to, machine, to the machine to learn which feature works the best. So creating features is another issue that is even much, much more complex than just learning the weights of the features. But uh, we assume that for the moment, we, we are the people who design our learning models, so we are designing our features, but we don't know if these features are useful or not, and let the machine to learn uh, which feature uh, works the best. Now, we are going to um, actually describe, uh, I think we, go, uh, we are going to switch to the demo and model this uh, problem in LB Java. Uh, we are going to use simple set of features we don't use the actual solution as a feature. I think the solution of that problem, if you remember it, 
was the second uh, position of the first name was a vowel. vowel oh, don't tell right? me. I didn't know that. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> that was okay, now I have to write it in <laughs> as, as part of the features. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but, um, I won't cheat, I promise. I won't try that. <laughs> But I think we can try more simplistic features first and see well, how it works, like uh, use the type of the character in the first five positions of the name. If the first position is A, uh, like I have this, for example, first character of first name is A, first character of the first name is B, and so on. And the second character, check all of these and use these as features and see which one, if this works or not. So the first uh, five character positions of the first name and the first five positions of the last name, we use it as a feature and program it in LB Java now and see if it works or not. So, yeah, I don't know if we need that, but yeah, you can see. Okay. Yeah, so, um, okay, I'm going to assume you have, uh, you've seen the, the course website and there was a, a zip file there saying LB Java examples and that you've all downloaded it and all already played with it and and if you haven't, it's fine. I'm going to show you exactly how to do it uh, now. But um, I'm going to first pretend that um, I don't know the solution. I don't really know the problem that well. I might have some intuitions, as, as Parisa was saying, about the domain. And I'm going to assume that someone just gave me this file that contains just the list of names. This is the one, the file that you found on the website, right? So it's just a list of names shy of. 300 names. I'm like, okay, I need now to learn um, to learn this um, over this space. So um, the first thing to notice is that we don't have a different train set and test set, which, as as Parisa mentioned, and uh, as I know you've you've been taught, is is crucial to making sure that you're learning algorithm is actually learning. So if, if I use the same thing to train over and learn over, it will be amazing. You know, every single time I'll get great results because I learned over the examples that I'm trying to predict. Um, so the first thing to do is to separate uh, this main file into a test and a train. Uh, a rule of thumb is that you go for a, an 80-20 split, 80% uh, train, 20% test. Um, a variation of that is like 70-30. Um, I usually recommend people having a third split, which is a development set, which is where you do all your internal testing until you're very sort of sure that you have a model that's working and you know what it's doing, and then you apply it on the blind, you know, sort of never untouched test set. And that's how you know it's like it will work in the real world, basically. That's how we simulate that. Okay, so we have... For now, we don't have a, devel a development set where we have a, a train and a test set. And the other thing that I will assume is a given, uh, which is what you will have to have uh, if you're writing an uh, LB Java application from scratch, is a reader. So in our case, I don't know if you can see. Can you see it in the back? Yeah, nods? Yeah, good, OK. Um, it's the simplest reader you can think of. It's literally just parsing a file, reading it line by line, storing it in a list. Sorry? Which file? The zip? Oh, well, assistant. <laughs> what happened there? Our people are working on it. Do not worry. <laughs> and we apologize. Uh, in the meantime, you can imagine what the, the file will contain, and it's these things. So, uh, yeah, a bit of patience, and uh, it should be up, Adam, pretty soon. Uh, just give me like one minute. Okay, one minute, <laughs> counting. Uh, okay, uh, so we have, uh, as I said, our reader, it does a very, very basic thing, just stores things in, into a list, okay? Uh, the crucial bit of, um, of information that we need to know is that this list, uh, if you don't know Java, it's okay, it's not really a requirement, so LB Java is its own language, so you don't really need to know, it helps if you know Java, it will be very familiar, but we will be working mostly on LB Java, not Java. Um, but if, if you do know Java, you will know that this guy here says that this list is over strings, it's just plain strings, string object, right? Uh, and this is crucial because this is what, in fact, I will be learning over. So my representation and my feature extraction and all of that 
will happen over just plain strings. And uh, with the later examples, I will show you that it can get much more complicated than just plain strings. Uh, the other thing to notice here is that this, uh, this reader here implements something that's called a parser, and this is a, an LBJava specific class that knows how to access here this, this next object. So this is for the learner itself. When, I, when it needs another example, it calls this function next and expects, expects uh, an object of the same type that we're learning, in this case a string. Uh, and and you know we have we have a termination here criterion which says if I'm basically I, if I run out of, of examples to give I will return a null element a zero a, a null element uh, which means that the learner should know to stop basically reading in. Um, so this is something that you have to write or you have to be provided uh, this this implementation of a, of a parser. But let's assume that we have it for now. So actually, I can add just something. Yes. So the parser is just like an iterator over the objects that you give to the learner. Yes. So it's just simple iterator. And you have to write, uh, if you re write your reader, then you just need to say, my reader now implements the parser. I have the next reset clause to just implement those methods right. there. Um, minute is up. Yes, good. OK. Nods, yes. OK, good. Excellent. We're flying. Um, it's OK. You will be fired promptly. Um, so now we have our reader. You'll see the structure uh, is pre-populated with these files. Uh, and I've kind of cheated and started writing my LBJava code. Uh, oh, sorry, the other, the other folder contains the, the, the pre-compiled libraries. This is like you need to, to have these in order to make LBJava work. Um, so now here's the meat of this demo. And yes, you can probably see it. Yes? OK. So as I said, I, I've cheated and I started writing uh, part of my LBJava code. And what I've written is the feature extraction part. So as I said, we're working over strings, just, just plain strings, which is every single line of that file, with you know, including the label, including the first name and the last name, and potentially a middle name. Uh, excuse me. Um, so what I want to do is I want to separate the first name from the last name, from the surname. Uh, and so I, I've written two feature extractors. And the way that you can tell it's a feature extractor is that it has this special character here, this special sorry uh, name here, which is discrete. And it has this percentage. And all this means is that this function here, called name features, it will return a discrete feature. So these are usually just, just straight strings. The, the percentage just means more than one. So it's like the plural mark of this. Um, it operates over a string. As, as we saw, this is what the reader returns. So this is what the feature extraction will be over. And this is the main body of the definition of the feature extractor. Um, this is just plain Java. All of this inside this definition is just Java, um, vanilla Java code. Um, and what I do here in this bit, and we don't really have to go into much detail, is I make sure that I don't take the middle name into account. Uh, there are some cases where the, there's, a, there's an initial uh, and then the first name and the surname. So I, I make sure that I don't take anything that is just length of two, which is like a single letter and then the, the period. So I ignore that. And now I have my name. So now, for the features, as Bursa was saying, I thought I'd use, let's say, the, the, the positions of the letters and the letters themselves. So from 0 to 1, or from 1 to, sorry, from 0 to 4, 5, no, 0 to 4, or from 1 to 5, uh, I will take the ith letter. And if there is no ith letter, I will just say it's null. Uh, and the, oh yes, right. So this is the other thing that you need to note here, which is different than Java. This sense word here, keyword, is just like a return, if you know Java. So the only difference is that we use, if we have more than one features generated from a function, we don't use return. We don't want the function to stop. So we use sense to like pull these results together and collect them and, and send them off to the classifier. OK, um, very simple. Uh, the same, I do the same for the surname, only this time I make sure that I get the you know, second or potentially third 
split of my of my data. Remember, remember, there is the the first of those splits. The white space is the label itself. So this is where I left off, and this is what I'm actually going to do now. So what I want to say is, what do I need to learn? I need to learn a label for these for these examples, and the label can be plus or minus, right? It's a binary decision. So this is the way you dis you. Uh, define the, the label that you need to learn in the in a classifier. So you go, it's another discrete, so it's a simple s return string, but this time we know it's a binary operation, so we can tell it that this discrete is over either a plus or a minus. Uh, we can just call it label. It's the same thing. It still operates over strings. And the function definition now is very simple to this guy, which is very similar, sorry, to this guy, which is defining this, uh, we split the, the single string, and then we just return the, uh, the first field, which is the label. And if you notice, I did use return here, because there is no percentage, because there's a single feature, there's a single label that we need to return, right? There's no list of labels. Okay, and now for the fun stuff. Now we have feature extraction, we have labels, now we just need to learn it, right? And this is the part where, at the end of this course, you'll thank me because this is like five lines, and you'll know how hard it is to get to these five lines. But you don't know this now. Um, so, <laughs> this definition of the classifier starts very simply as, again, what is it going to return? So. The classifier, as Parisa said, is still going to return a label, right? So we need to predict stuff uh, from, for, for new examples. So what we do is we say, OK, discrete. We're going to call this a classifier. It still operates over strings, so that everything is the same. And now is the fun stuff. So we need to say, what do I need to learn? I need to learn a label. OK, straightforward. Uh, what do I need to learn it with? I need to use. Uh, stop doing that. I need to use either. So these are the features that I'm going to use, right? I need. I can use either name features, surname features, or both. Okay. I'm going to start with surname features. I have a hunch that the the, the meat of this puzzle is in the surname, right? Shh, if you know that. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> Um, so it's called surname features, and then now we need to tell it where it will find the data. This is where our reader comes in, right? So we need to say you can learn this from a, a new instance. So this is Java-like code of a badge reader, okay? And if you remember here, let me show you again. The badge reader has a constructor that just takes a single uh, argument, which is the data file itself, right? So I can say, OK, it's a badge reader, and the data was called badges.train. Uh, OK, so badges.train.txt. OK. Uh, now, what else? We need to say how many rounds of training do we need to do? This is a parameter that you can tune in Later, I'm just for now. I'm going to do five rounds of training because I think it's a simple problem. You should have no problem learning it. Uh, now, uh, what's left? The, the classifier itself. So, what learning method do we need to use? Uh, as Parisa mentioned, there are multiple choices at this stage for you. We will start with the simplest one, which is a naive base classifier. Uh, and if you don't know what it does, you will by the end of this course. Um, so, uh, no. We say naive Bayes, and if I can spell. OK. And finally, we need to test. We need to make sure that the thing is learning what we wanted to learn, right? So we need to say test from new badge reader, this time with the test data. OK. And this is the, there we go, the end. That's it. That is the whole thing. Now, 
if the demo gods are with us, <laughs> uh, what you need to do, uh, it should be on the slides for later, the, the list of instructions that you need to do, is you first need to compile the reader itself. It's a Java code, just need to compile it as you would with Java C. Uh, if this doesn't work for you and you get some versioning problems, note that you need to have Java 7, 1.7. And if you don't, uh, let me know, and we, yeah, we, there is no simple solution, but we can recompile Elb Java code for you, and it will work for your version. Okay? So, oops. Yep. Um, this is just telling it, put all the, the binary files inside the bin folder. Oops. <laughs> Working. Because oh, I'm not in the correct folder. There we go. Okay. Right, so the second step. So this was the first step, right? So now we have a binary reader, Java code. Now we need to compile LB Java. And what I mean by compiler with Java is I mean we need to translate this high-level language that we wrote into actual Java code that our JVM will, write, will run, right? So the way you do this is you call the main function of the LB Java package, bless you, which resides in the bin folder here, and you, oops, and you call this... Illinois.cs.cogcomp.lbjava. Okay. Um, we need to tell it to put the binary files that it produces in the same directory as the binary files uh, that we have. And finally, the classifier that we wrote. And hopefully... Ah, okay. This is... Ah, oh, yes. Because it's not called feature, it's called features. Silly me. And now you know how to debug this. Um, nope. <laughs> Close <laughs> enough. And this is called fields. It's not called field. Okay. There. That's it. So, what we've done. Let me show you what we've done. What we've done is we've created these extra files here. We've created a thing called a classifier a thing called label, a thing called name features and surname features. All of these were created from scratch, from LB Java. all of this code, right? So all of this code you should have written yourselves, but you don't have to. Uh, and this is why LB Java is awesome. Uh, and specifically, this code that you don't want to write. There we go. All of that resulted in getting an accuracy of 64%. Which is not good, is it? <laughs> okay. We know it's not good. And we have a suspicion why it might not be good. So let's try this. Let's try name features. Maybe the answer is in the first name and not the surname. So let's try this. What I'm doing here, this X thing, is make sure that it cleans everything it removes all the previously compiled Java files, so I have a fresh start, and now I can do it again. There we go, 95%. Right? Right? Okay. <laughs> we're good. We're good. So, that means that not only we defined a classifier in five lines, not only we trained it without doing anything, we have a clue now as to where the correct answer is. So you can keep playing with this, and you can keep refining the features, and you can keep adding different features until you potentially hit on the answer that we now know, because spoilers. Um, okay, so that was the first demo that I wanted to do. So I think the point that you, uh, you need to keep in mind is that now you have really for features, you, you're working with an actual object. So you don't need to yes. see, uh, my object is in a string, and then I say the first character of this object is my feature. So you don't need to encode this as a binary feature and uh, keep a lexicon of all uh, values of this 
for the learner. This is the things that we will, will be done in behind the scene, actually. So you are acting on your object, and for learning also, you, you pass your object, which is the string. So you don't care how this string converted to a vector of features that my naive-based method will use, for example. So that is yep. actually the level of abstraction that you get here. Everything is in terms of uh, objects, in terms of like high-level objects exactly. in Java language. Yeah. Okay, and uh, a final thing before we switch to the second demo is that this here, this classifier object, is an, a completely normal Java object that I can now use in a normal Java program. And in fact, you will see in the Twitter exercise that you will get, this is exactly how you do it. So you learn this classifier, and it itself has stored all the feature weights and the, and the, and the values that it learned. So it now is ready to classify new things for you on demand. So you literally just say, I want a new classifier, and then classifier dot, you know, classify, and it will give you a value, and that's it. It's as simple as that to use afterwards, right? Okay, so now we can move to the second example. So this is, again, the list of, oops, <laughs> the list of commands that I, I have, so you, you have it on the slide. Okay, no, I just uh, introduced a couple of other examples yet that you see how we, uh, depending on the problem that we're going to solve, how we switch between uh, different kind of feature spaces and the type of the learning algorithms that we might be able to use. For example, this spam uh, classifier also some, some tasks that most of you uh, will know. Uh, we want to, we have a bunch of emails every day. Um, many of them are a spam and we want to have like a model that tells us giving the content of the email tells us if this is a spam or not. So here also we have the problem of what are the features, what kind of classifier we are going to use, and then making those classifiers and use them. So spam, no spam. So uh, actually, the first thing that we, are, uh, we, when we want to design a learning model for this, we should think of is that how a spam looks like. What are the features that, as a human, I look at it and see, oh, this should be a spam. So probably, again, the first thing is to look at the lexical information. You see it here in this, um, we don't have a pointer, right? In that picture there, you see most of the spams have like discount. Uh, this shows, actually, this picture shows the, that the frequency of the terms in some uh, email that can be in a spam. A spam. So uh, this is like the discount, like um, what is e the other free order offer, or offer, yeah. like cash, rates, like check, uh, these kind of things, or winner sometimes. These kind of <laughs> words, if you <laughs> look at uh, your spam folder, you see that these kind of words happen often in your spam folder. So maybe the just lexical, looking at the surface of the email and look at looking at the words that are occurring in there could be a good feature to realize what is a spam and what is not. And then uh, we're going to, again, write our features based on these uh, words that occur in the documents in LB Java. Um, so that is the next example. And then again, we can switch to the sure. code. So since we want to look at, um, at just word features, we need to have a way of representing the words in a document, right? So instead of this time, I mean, I, I can show you what my training data looks like. Again, I'm, I'm thinking of this as an application engineer, and I have a data set that I, you know, I will inspect and say, you know, oh, I have, you know, maybe here is a, an example of a spam email. Um, yeah, I, I don't even want to read it because my computer would read it for me. It's fine. So I have my data, and it just looks like you know a single document with a single file. And what I do want to do is replicate that structure for my learner, right? So instead of having my LB Java code operate over strings, this time I wanted to operate over documents. So document, I will have to write myself in Java because it's, a, it's this structure. And for now, it's as simple as here's the list of words that it contains. Here's the label that it has, so I can access it immediately. And it has you know, a, a, an ID you know, that I can, um, I can access. Um, so now my, my reader oops, 
my reader, instead of giving me a list of strings, it will give me, with this next function, it will give me a list of documents. Right? So uh, one thing that I didn't mention before is, in the previous example, in the badges, I loaded everything in memory. Right? So I had this list of strings that I defined in the beginning. And I, loaded, I read the file in, I loaded the, uh, the list in memory, and then I kept popping you know, things from the list, uh, um, accessing things from a list. That doesn't have to be the case. This next function can like go in, find the file, read it at the spot, return the, the document that represents the file, and move on to the next file. So this is completely up to you. It's up to developing something that works for the application and works for the domain. Um, so now that we know, and, and here is how, uh, sorry, here is how the document itself is created. So it has uh, the file itself, which contains the text, and a label, which, is, which comes from the folder in this case. So everything is the same as far as the, the classifier is concerned. So if we see, so this is a pre-made example. Uh, as far as the classifier is concerned, it has a document reader, which is again a type of parser. It takes in training data, it takes in test data, and it's uh, returning, in this case, documents. Right? So the classifier is over documents, the feature extraction is over documents, and the label is over documents. Right? So this is the thing to notice um, in these examples. So now my features, um, so as, as we saw, it might just be the case that words themselves are enough, because there are some words that have so, you know, uh, that, that, that are so frequent in spam emails that only knowing those words might be enough. Uh, but keep, keep in mind that this is a learning program. It's not a set of like, oh, if I see this word, you know, success or reward or a word or something, then it's immediately a spam. All of this is sort of a, a soft way of saying the same thing. It's like, maybe it is. And the more of those words you see, the more likely it is that it is a spam, right? So um, the, so the words... Uh, that we get from the document, it was a list of words, right? So the way we create the, the features, again, we have multiple, this percentage thing, multiple discrete features, and this is called a bag of words. It's literally just throw all the words in a bag, no order necessary, we don't need to know if they're in the same sentence or not, just throw them in. Uh, and and this, this snippet literally just does that. It says there's a new sense, there's a new feature for every single word that is a, there is in a document. Um, we have here what we call a bigram feature, which is um, two consecutive words strung together as a single feature. Because we, we want to capture something higher order than just simple words. Maybe, maybe the fact that it is, you know, um, what was it? You won. That this, this bigram, these two strings together, is actually informative rather than you and one, because those, might, those words might appear in a normal, you know, uh, non-spam email. Okay? Our classifier, again, is a discrete. It returns only a single label. Again, it's a binary classification. It's either spam or ham, uh, which is the, yeah, non-spam. Um, it's called a spam label. And for our classifier definition, the only thing that you'll notice is changing, other than the number of rounds that I'm training, is now with you using a different learner. So the list of learners you will see in the, uh, the manual that we have a link to in the slides later, there is a list of potential learners that you can use. A sparse average perceptron is one of them. And we've added this, this uh, extra line here that says, report us every 2,000 examples that you have processed, 2,000 examples. Yes? What is meant by the number of rounds? It is how many rounds of training I will do with the same data set. So uh, I don't know if you've touched this uh, um, in, the, right, in the class already, but each uh, learning method will have to do more than one pass of the entire data set to, to strengthen, basically, the, the hypothesis that it makes. So one round, like one pass over the data, might not be enough to learn, uh, to learn the weights um, for the features that you need. And this is why uh, we need to define yeah, multiple, multiple rounds. All of that will be clear once you, once you know some uh, more details about the algorithms. Uh, but yes, so just keep in mind that 
this is the number of passes that we need to do over the data. And the more you do, the better you will fit the training data, which is a, a cautionary sort of, we need to sort of caution this because if you fit the training data too well, you might not be able to predict the test data as well. So you need to keep a balance of, you know, I don't need to learn the training data super well because they might be different from the test data, but you assume that they come from the same population, so therefore you need to, uh, to know both. Okay, that, just to point to that, uh, we don't need to set that. There are defaults, and also depends on the learning model. For some learning models, maybe right. it doesn't make sense to say go over and over and over again. Yeah. Right, right, so right. So, yeah. for example, for uh, perceptron, you really train. You look at the data and adjust the weights of your model during the iteration. So it makes sense to give the uh, give the rounds. And uh, you just determine it because maybe you don't want to wait a lot and you want to just give a quick uh, training. So you just choose a small number. Otherwise, you rely on the defaults of the model. Any other questions? OK. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly run through the, um, the same, basically the same motions that I did uh, before, which is we compile the Java classes. So now we have the document and the document reader to compile, because they're Java files. And then we just compile the LB Java code into Java and train it at the same time. And hopefully, OK, good. <laughs> so as you see, it reports every 2,000 examples. And we'll go over many rounds. We said 50? 50, yeah. There you go. 94%. 94.7. Well, let's say 95. We're good. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, again, as I said, this created this object here called spam classifier, which you can call from a Java program. And you can say, you know, here's a new, I, I'm, I'm building an email client in Java or in Android or something. I want to be able to classify spam and put it in a spam folder. You literally just call this classifier, you give it a single document, and it will give you a single label. Right? It's as simple as that. OK? Now for the third example. Yeah. So the last demo is just to uh, switch to another domain, which is totally different, like the computational biology. Uh, there also, uh, you see, for example, we want to have, we have the patient data. And then we want to, uh, for example, we have data about the patients with cancer, specific types of cancer. And then uh, we want to try different drugs on them and see if they respond to a specific drug or not. So the data is about, as you see uh, here, um, the data is with in Excel sheets. Like you have an Excel, uh, Excel sheet about uh, patient clinical and personal information, like the age, age um, race, and so on. And you have another Excel sheet, which is the experimental uh, uh, the, that come the experiments that come from um, lab tests, like for example, for hundred or two thousand or twenty thousand genes, they give uh, they make some experiments on each patient, and then for each gene they have a real value, which says, okay, uh, what is the expression of this gene, for example, for this patient. And then uh, this is our input. So we have the patient data and the gene experiments for each patient. And then we want to predict um, if a specific patient will respond to drug um, X or not, or patient X will respond to drug Y or not. Um, so drug response actually is a real, uh, real valued uh, variable um, as it is measured um, now with, bio with biologists. But in this example, we don't want to uh, switch uh, to, the, to a regression setting. So we, are, uh, we want to keep uh, our setting as the kind of classification setting. That's why uh, we can just put a threshold and uh, turn the drug response real values to 0 and 1. If they are above a threshold, we say, OK, the res drug response is positive, And the, the patient responds to this drug. And if it is below a threshold, we say these are negative. The, patient didn't respond to this drug. So we have, like uh, again, a binary decision setting. And then we can have a simple example just uh, that we can write it again in LV Java with a couple of lines of code. So maybe you could show the code of that. 
this is in fact one of my favorite examples because this is a domain I didn't know. I, I only do language. And this shows how you know, cool this LB Java stuff is because um, all I needed to know is that there is a way to get a feature representation from a file with a reader. That's all I needed to know. I, I don't know what drug response means. I don't know, you know what gene expressions are. Or, in fact, I didn't know what they looked like until I saw the data. And in fact, uh, I don't even... So if you see the data, so we have uh, the gene expressions, we have the drug responses, and we have the patient lists. So I can show you what the patient's lists look like. So we have, you know, uh, some, some IDs. Identifiers. Right, identifiers. We have their age. We have whether they're uh, female or male uh, and their uh, ethnicity. So this is easy for me to understand, but then I don't even want to show you the, the expressions because this is what it looks like. When I tried to open it, I crashed yeah, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> she didn't warn me about this. I was like, oh, okay, I can do this. Um, so here's what it looks like. It's just an endless, so is it what, 5,000 genes that uh, it tests? 20,000. 20,000 yeah. genes. Yeah. So it's a line, it's an expert sheet line that has 20,000 columns. So all of this is a, single, is a single row that I'm reading now, right? All of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, my text editor was like, no, no way. I'm not doing this. So, but this is the fun part. It's like, I only wanted to know what the format of the thing is like. Oh, okay, it's tab, tab separated. That's the only thing I need to know to write my reader, right? So my reader now... We have my, my, my main variable now is a sample, what I call a sample. Again, it's a structured, it's a structured data, uh, it's a data structure um, for, uh, for an object. Um, and then it takes these three files it takes the patient file, the drugs response file, and the gene expression file, right? And this is just basically, you know, reading the files, matching the patients with their responses given their ID. So this is all, you know, very standard Java stuff um, that. You know, you, you, you can learn, you know, if you know Java, this is fairly straightforward. If you don't, it's very easy to see, you know, find some code snippets to see how do I read the file, how do I split at, you know, tab or new line, and how do I correct, uh, create lists of things. So for the gene expression file, this, that, that huge file, all I, wanted, all I knew was that one line corresponded to one patient, and that patient had an ID, and I just link, need to link those two um, there. So now I have a list of double values, of real values, for my gene expression. I have a list of double values of my drug responses, so one, uh, one value for each drug. Uh, and all of this is represented in my object. So my sample object looks something like this. Let me go. So it, it's as simple as it can get, right? So I have all of the patient information, and I have my drug responses and my gene expressions, right? So now that I know what my data reader will return and what my actual data structure is, I can go to my classifier and say, okay, I know we operate over samples, right? Sample is my data structure. My features are a single discrete value for gender, discrete meaning, you know, string, a single discrete value for ethnicity, a discrete for age, this I could have turned into a real value because age is a number. It doesn't really matter for our purposes. And here is a real valued list, since we have this uh, percentage, list of numbers, right? And this is the gene expression. And what it says is, um, for each sample, go to the gene expression and just concatenate all of the things in a, in a single list. Um, as Parissa said, this can be a regression uh, learner, so you can return and you can learn a real value, so you can uh, regress to a real value, but for our purposes, I just thought it's easier to turn this into a binary classification problem. Does the patient respond to the drug or um, do they not? Um, so, uh, so I said uh, I, I averaged the thresholds, uh, the, the responses, I, I sort of plotted them in an Excel spreadsheet and I average the response for the drug and I say, okay, if it's above the average, I will assume that the, the patient responds positively. If it's below, 
negatively. All of this is the main knowledge that you can ask. You probably are the expert or you're working with an expert, so all of this can be codified by them. And my classifier, again, is very, very simple. Um, I'm using gender, ethnicity, and age as predictors, as features, to predict um, my values, my, my response. Again, I'm using a sparse average perceptron, and I'm reading and testing from these different files, from test files and train files. Um, so what I wanted to show you was that if we do, let me do this quickly, and hopefully nothing breaks. Okay. So this will take just a tiny bit more time. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> Faster than I expected. So this 60% might actually be slightly misleading because if you see, we make no true predictions. We always think it's, it's a negative response, right? So, uh, and this is what, I, I, um, I don't know if you have been told about precision and recall, but recall basically me means how many of my predictions, of the things that I predicted, how many are correct? And they're 100%, you know, of the things that are false, I predicted false all the time, so therefore I'm 100 percent correct of those things. We have 60% false and they are all uh, predicted. Exactly. So they're 60% they're false, 40% uh, true in my data set. So those 60% I have to get. Mm -hmm. um, but let's see what happens if I add my gene expression. Actually, it was quick because you didn't use gene expression. Oh, right. That's <laughs> good point. Good point. So let's see. So now remember, this is a 20,000 valued you know, array of things which I didn't even want to think about. So, let's clean this up and try again. Hopefully this will give me some boost. Now it takes a bit of time. Come on, 20,000 values. Can you do it faster? <laughs> there you go, 65%. And now we have predictions for both true and false, right? So you can see it's the gene expression that makes the most difference. It's basically saying, if I only know your age, your ethnicity, and your gender, I can't really tell whether you will respond to this drug, this, this cancer drug or not. Um, so this is, again, a helpful tool. A biologist can use this as simply as I, as I pointed out to do these predictions like on the fly, right? Uh, yep, yeah. and that's the last of my example. We have like... Yeah, 10 more minutes, so, 5 more minutes. Okay, yeah. so I think uh, we, we are done almost with mm -hmm. the whole thing. We just uh, point to the exercise, so the uh, Twitter uh, sentiment classification. So um, Christos made the code. Everything, maybe you can describe it yourself yeah. also, yeah. So. Uh, I can quickly go through the code. Uh, what the main part of this code is, and I will show you this in a graphical user interface because it will make much more sense to see the full structure of the code. Oh, we have, until, I thought we, yeah. are, we are finished time, so uh, we have 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime for stuff that maybe you can't run or maybe you tried things, no? Okay, so here's the Twitter client that we wrote. It has two distinct components. It has the classifier component and it has the real-time Twitter library getter component. We haven't named this completely. Um, so the classifier is, as you will see here, is a simple Elbow Java classifier, right? Exactly straightforward as you've seen, you know, again and again. Um, very simple features for now. This is something that you will, uh, that you can play with. Uh, I'm using the same bigram uh, and unigram sort of word features that we use for the spam classifier, but this you can expand on. Uh, my training and test set are basically um, just lines of value, whether it's positive or negative, the username, the time that it was um, gathered, it was produced, and then the tweet, uh, the tweet text itself, right? So um, my, oops, excuse me. So no, the object is called tweet instead exactly. of document, but it's so actually the, the piece of text of tweet. Exactly. Yeah. So my reader and my classifier operate over this thing called tweet. The tweet has 
uh, as I said, just the sentiment label and the text, but you can expand this, you can add the time that was created or the username um, that, that generated that tweet. And now for the fun part, which is that we have a way for you to get the live stream from Twitter right now, which is to define classifier client here. So you define this Twitter client, uh, and you can use different filters to classify it. So it's really hard to get access to what is called the fire hose of Twitter, which is like every single tweet on the planet right now. Not only because it will crash your computer, because it's like a billion tweets a second, but also because it's, you know, we need to pay for that, or we need like special licenses for that. So what we are allowed to have is a filtered version of that stream. And filtering can be done on either search terms, or it can be done on location. So we have for you some predefined locations here um, with their coordinates. And this is how tweets, uh, Twitter uh, gives you the data for. So you can check against a bounding box of coordinates. So you can use any of these locations, or you can add your own. Uh, you will find this web page here that you will find lo uh, location bounding boxes. And by using a location, you can say, OK, I want in real time, every single tweet that comes from this location, right? And you can define as many locations as you want, or you can defy here, define here, excuse me, here as many search terms that you want, or you can define both. It doesn't matter. So you can say, I want tweets that mention machine learning or that mention, I don't know, who, who's like, you know, Miley Cyrus, I don't know, I'm old. Um, and, and I want them to be in, English and Spanish, right? So you can also define filtered, uh, you can filter for languages, right? Uh, you have to know the language codes for this, but you can find them easily enough online. And then what you say is, remember how I told you that the, the classifier is a ready-made object? It is this. It is as simple as saying, I want an instance of this pre-trained classifier, and then I will push this into my handler, and then every time I get the text, the text of the tweet, I will call this classifier and I will get a discrete value, this, this, this label that it re re returns. And basically, that is the decision. That is all you need to do to classify sentiment on Twitter. And the codes should be available online. The instructions are online. But, right, there is a readme file. Uh, it tells you how to install the, the tools that you will need, Java, Maven, um, you need to register with Twitter to do this. So you need to register as a developer. Sorry, if you, yeah, so I think you need a username, like a Twitter account for that. Yes, and yeah. also you need to provide your telephone number. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, we, we don't have control over Twitter. I, if we could, we would have made this easier for you. But yeah, unfortunately, you know, the, the cool stuff comes with a price. So uh, yeah, play around. It's, it's not a no, yeah, this is not, yeah, you're not going to be graded on this. This is just for you to have fun and, like, see how LB Java works in action. We could have made it, but, no, we, yeah, we decided not to. So, yeah, let us know how it goes. We will be here on Thursday. Uh, ask questions and, yeah, have fun. Maybe the, the last slide also will show. Yeah, we should, we should put it at the... Uh, this one is the, no, the next one. Uh, I, I don't know if it's... No, because they're all leaving, yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. So, at
Testing, testing, okay.